we are live. Welcome to 2021's Shang-Chi Review and Thoughts film, The Legend of the Ten Rings. I know, I'm a little late on this one. It premiered almost a week ago. I guess by the time you're watching this, it has been a week. It did not hit cinemas near me until today or by the time you're watching this yesterday. You know, I watched it on the, the 9th. And unfortunately, I was not able to watch it in 3D, but hopefully the, you know, let's see, Eternals is the very next MCU. Hopefully, Theater Near Me and 3D. Now, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. Now, I watched this in a theater because where I live, COVID is under control. If you do not live in an area where COVID is under control, please do not watch this in a theater. No movie is worth risking spreading COVID. Even if you think you yourself will be safe, there's probably someone you might accidentally spread it to that you don't want to spread it to. Now, I am currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. Let's see. The... Yeah, so I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done, until I'm done with the spoiler, so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in the franchise, and that includes the Disney Plus shows. As soon as I end the review itself, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie, including discussing the ending. I'll no longer be warning before giving spoilers. So, if this is the first of these videos by me that you watch, then just to get you up to speed, I love every MCU movie. They're all in the... 7 out of 10 to 10 out of 10 range. Although I don't make any excuses for Iron Man 2, and I love every episode that's come out so far of the Disney Plus MCU shows. WandaVision's a 10 out of 10, so Captain America and the Winter Soldier, Season 1 of Loki, and the episodes of What If that have aired. So, you know, up to and including What If Zombies. Now, content warning and or trigger warning. <sighs> Yeah, the, the following, not all of the following is stuff I'm going to be discussing in the video, but it is stuff that is in the movie. Let's see. There we go. Torture, kidnapping, gaslighting, murder. Body horror and xenophobia. Now, the movie is rated PG 13, and so is this video. Also, please note that I have a tendency to sometimes, when I'm discussing a sensitive subject, use descriptive terms that I consider neutral that other people consider negative so if I say something that sounds judgmental it may very well just be that I take for granted that people know I'm being descriptive and not judgmental I'm not trying to be disrespectful I'll also be doing my best to correctly pronounce the names you know just FYI I'm, I'm probably gonna mess up at least some of them like today I know how to pronounce Navi, but when I first did a video on Avatar, what was it that I was it not Nari or Nati? I, I forget exact, but I, I messed it up and I didn't realize it all until somebody you know pointed it out to me. Anyway, this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual. So it's just clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. Now, anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. 
It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it, what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing. Earlier movies in the franchise, I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this video are fair criticisms based on budget when it came out, what it's trying to achieve, etc. So, you know, if you if you haven't yet watched this movie, yeah, in order to Yeah, you'll you'll definitely want to have watched before watching this movie Doctor Strange, The Incredible Hulk, and Iron Man 3, and oh yeah, also All Hail the Chief, which is now on Disney Plus, at least in some countries. You know, used to only be available by buying the Blu-ray of Thor the Dark World. Because they got to sell copies of that movie somehow. I still... I still love that movie, but... Yeah, it's hard to not take that as a sort of... You know, they, they kind of realized we're not going to be able to sell copies of this movie. And, you know, people really, really want us to... You know... People really didn't like the Mandarin in Iron Man 3. So, anyway, let's see. The, um, you don't technically need to have watched Infinity War and Endgame, but you do need to know about the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm not avoiding spoilers here. I gotta, remi I gotta remember that. You need you do need to know about the snap and the blip, and I suppose that is so. So yeah, you know if I know a lot of people aren't going to want to watch the Incredible Hulk and Iron Man three. I think they're some of the best the MCU has to offer, but you know to each their own. But yeah, if if you have no idea who Wong and Okay, technically, you don't need to have watched The Incredible Hulk, but I do. I, I would definitely say there's stuff in this movie that's gonna mean nothing to you if you haven't, at the very least, watched Doctor Strange. If if Wong doesn't mean anything to you, yeah, you know he he appears in this movie. That's not a spoiler for this movie. He appears in this movie, and what he does and says carries weight because we're familiar with him from. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor Strange, Infinity War, and Endgame. So, let's see. The, um, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, I have only watched this movie once, and I started recording this video pretty much as soon as I got home from the theater, so it is fresh in my mind. Now, yeah, so, plot. Shang-Chi was raised by his father, Wen Wu, who runs a criminal empire, to be an effective fighter, and I don't think I'm going to give away exactly what. Yeah, I'll I'll just you know, but yeah, that was that was his childhood. In present day, Shanti is living far away from his father, and yeah. Now, the, yeah, I, I don't want to give too much away. Let's just say that, you know, some things happen that make Shang-Chi think that maybe his father is, you know, trying to do something that's going to affect, 
yeah, I, th I think that's as much as I'm going to say. But the, yeah, you know, basically, Shang-Chi, there is this, there's there's a, a sense that he may need to stop his father and he worries if he would even be able to do that now yeah the 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 action is tremendously fun the the fantasy is very the movie isn't afraid of being of of embracing its fantasy elements and let's see um yeah so the imdb more like this list was less useful than usual which i didn't know was possible the only stuff that was on there was stuff that hasn't come out yet which makes me wonder if the people who choose these even know what a more like this is is it supposed to anyway it's not especially useful is all i'm i'm saying when you when you're only comparing it to things that haven't come out so no one knows exactly what anyway it compares it to a bunch of stuff that hasn't come out yet and Candyman 2021 which I rated 9 out of 10 now yeah the the title the fact that it's not just called Shang-Chi or Shang-Chi the master of kung fu but the legend of the ten rings underlines this time we are getting if I understand the movie correctly if I understand Wen Wu he does not like the he didn't intentionally take the name Mandarin he doesn't like that name being used to like yeah so I'm not going to be I'm going to be referring to him as Wen Wu yeah this time it's Wen Wu. It's not the the fake out in Iron Man three of of the Mandarin, you know. And I gotta say, I, you know, I wasn't one of the people who was really upset about it when that movie came out. I'm not above it. There are plenty of other things where I've gotten super annoyed with, you know. I I have my share of nerd rage, but. I think their rage made this movie better. I think it was already going to be a really good movie, but the fact that there is so much focus on Wen Wu really is like you know, if you if you've been like if you spent the last 8 years really frustrated that you might not get Wen Wu or that it would be a really long time or they wouldn't do him justice this is the movie you've been waiting for. This really, like... I understand why people are so passionate about the character. Because he is fascinating. He is deeply compelling to watch. And I'm really, really glad that he's... Yeah. Now, let's see. So, yeah, for those who might not know, I watch and review pretty much every single comic book adaptation movie that goes to theaters. And, you know, there are, yeah, also ones that are in continuity with ones that go to movie theaters, but where I can only stream it because there's no movie theater close to me that actually plays it because, heh. I'm really glad that they changed the the same day streaming release 
thing for this one because that's why this one went to theaters and why Black Widow did not. But yeah, this is one of the cases where I was really looking forward to it and might have chosen to watch it even if it wasn't something that I was already going to watch. So I might criticize I am in favor of representation in movies. So, you know, I think it's likely that I'll be saying something negative about the... So I just want I just want to make it clear. I'm not saying that movies shouldn't have representation. I'm saying that there are some ways in which this movie could have done a better job with representation. Now, yeah, one there was one critic who gave it a two out of ten and said, you know, the the yeah, I'm just gonna quote, I disagree with them, but I do think they have, yeah. Other than having an all-Asian cast, which is mostly put to waste on over-Americanized script, there's nothing inspiring about this film. I do find it inspiring, but I do... Yeah, this is definitely a very Western version of, you know, the... the yeah. And I, I could... Un, I can imagine a number of... I mean, I think it's especially made for Chinese people, but a Asians in general. I can imagine, you know, they, like, if you're watching this video and you're Asian, try, try to not get your hopes up for it being, like, a, a fully committed, like, this was made specifically for Asian audiences kind of thing it is very very western in its yeah you know like do do not expect this is not an Ang Lee movie this is not like yeah so so but I do think that you know and and at the same time it's also like there are there are some, like the, you know, some of the, the, there's, there are some cultural aspects of this where it's very, it, it, it's, it's aimed more at Asian audiences to where, like, if you don't already, if you go into the movie and you don't already know very many of these things, you know, it's, it's the movie isn't going to tell you very much about them. You just kind of have to take them as is. I think overall they they got a pretty decent balance. You know, I, I, I'm not going to speak for Asians, you know, but... I suppose what I'll say is I think there's a there's a good chance that many Asians will you know feel seen by this movie they will yeah I think it would have been good if like Disney had put something on Disney Plus just I don't know, five to ten minutes, just very briefly giving a, just, just like, practically, like, let's see, is it dictionary? Encyclopedia, just a brief encyclopedia entry about some of these aspects that, you know, for, for Asian audience, you know, 
it, it's as far as I understand a number of these things are from like Asian folklore and yeah for the rest of just just brief description of what it is so that we can watch that before watching the movie and then one when, when we're watching the movie it's like oh it's it's that because okay now let's see. yeah so this is yeah this critic gave it four out of ten and they said that let's see yeah needlessly long movie that is abusing the flashback system and is almost entirely made of exposition and yeah it it really is A lot of this movie is is backstory, and I think it's impressive how well it works despite that, how good of a movie it still is, but it definitely, like, if, if that's the kind of thing that might bother you, this is definitely a movie that's going to frustrate you. Now... Yeah, and Kevin Feige on the red carpet pointed out that it's the first origin story the MCU has had for years. I'm pretty sure the last one, the last real one was Doctor Strange in 2016. Like, there have been first movies starring titular character, but it was like Spider-Man and Black Panther. Excellent movies, to be sure. I suppose, just very briefly, I think overall... Black Panther is probably at least a little bit better than this movie, but I do, I, th I think this movie has a real chance of inspiring Asian audiences the way that Black Panther inspired black audiences. And yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that we're, we're, we're finally doing these, you know, now. But yeah, and a number of people have said that we really don't need more origin stories in the MCU. They've been through that well, phase already. I think it was a really good thing that this is such an origin story, and it really is. It's it's very much about who Shang Chi is and his, you know, his experiences growing up with Wen Wu as his father, and yeah. You know, I am I am really really glad that we got an entire movie showing Shang Chi's backstory before he appeared in something where he's not the protagonist. I, yeah, you know, when I was a child, I also into my teen years, you know, when when there were movies and TV shows and such, if someone had an unusual name, very frequently, like, it would be anglicized, mocked, or both, very frequently both, and I really appreciate that today you can be a mainstream celebrity even if your name is unusual. It, I'm I'm really glad that it's gone in this direction. I I yeah, and you know a, a number of the people who worked on this movie have unusual names. You know the it's I I I'm really really glad that that this is yeah. Now let's. So it's pretty terrible that I have to say the following, but some people won't watch this movie if they aren't assured of the following. Not every straight white cis man in this film is depicted as being evil, inferior, etc. There are multiple major characters that fall into those categories, and they're not... Yeah. Now. So this was written by Dave Callahan who also wrote Wonder Woman 1984, 
Zombieland Double Tap, the Free Expendables movies. Oh, actually, yeah, for two and three, he just wrote characters, so. And Destin Daniel Cretton, who also directed it. And Destin also wrote, let's see. Oh, never mind. Actually, so I guess this is the first movie he's written, but he directed several movies that I have not watched. And finally, it was also written by Andrew Lanham. And I'm not familiar with his other work, but he wrote Just Mercy, The Kid, The Glass Castle, and The Shack. Now, let's see. Yeah, I, I think some of the writing is really good. Like, the... I think it does a, a good job of tying together these things that could seem very like, com yeah, bringing together strands that you would think would be separate. Now. So, quoting fellow critics here, lumbers along with a weighted down plot obsessed with backstory. Shang-Chi is refreshing in how little it's concerned with big picture universe building details. Instead, the movie focuses on an extremely personal story that also implies exciting things, the future of Marvel movies. The movie handles plot twists well largely i would say there's maybe one that i thought could have been better but largely good twists there there's the right amount of them not too many not too few they're not too easy to figure out i mean uh actually yeah ultimately two of the major twists I did figure out before the movie yeah before before the twist happened and I mean I'm not some kind of like genius who always figures out twists I I think I think it's that they weren't supposed to be completely out of left field for audiences I don't I don't think it's that they thought that no one would figure them out. I think it's that they thought that it wasn't as big of a problem, basically. But yeah, you know, if, if it's going to bother you, if you figure out the twist before the movie reveals the twist, it might happen at least twice with, with this one. But I, I would actually say, especially with the second one, I thought that was... Do you know that feeling when you kind of, when you almost get kind of a look behind the curtain and you're like, good, that's, yeah, nicely done. They, they did a good, that was kind of how I was feeling. And I would definitely say there were, there were some really major things that I did not see coming. So, yeah. This was directed by Destin Daniel Cretton, who directed Just Mercy, The Glass Castle, Short Term 12, and I Am Not a Hipster. So, yes, let's see. The, the Glass Castle was written, co-written by one, yeah, at least one of the other writers. So, yeah, you know, the, the director has worked with at least one of these writers before... So, quoting a fellow critic here, this is director Destin Daniel Cretton's first action movie, action film. You would not believe it with how confidently he shoots this movie. He does, he really does an incredible job. And he keeps the movie moving even though there are a lot, like, again, like flashbacks, 
sometimes it'll go direct pretty much directly from one flashback to another flashback and like yeah it, it's the movie works way better than it should if you just like if you if you asked someone to explain the movie to you and they didn't jump around they just gave you like they gave you the information in the exact same order that the movie did you would think that it's really difficult to keep up with or that the movie does a bad job and yeah i, w I would definitely not say that yeah I, th I think he did an incredible job on let's see the 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 humor the action the mythology and keeping us engaged with the the characters and the the drama between family members and such you know it's it's like the MCU keeps doing this like i i'm not 100% certain that there's a single choice of director where i you know where like there've been some where before the movie i was like how is how is that gonna work but after watching the movie i was like they did it they got it right you know and yeah i judging from the other movies that he's made this is very unlike him and yet he does an incredible job it's it's like because it's not like that always happens you know like the amazing spider-man maybe especially the second one more than the first one and Fantastic Four in 2015. Yeah, the Fantastic Four. I'm not saying both of those movies came out in 2015. I'm saying Fant Four Stick that came out in 2014, 2015, and Amazing Spider-Man Two that came out in 2014. You know, clearly the director just wasn't quite ready for something that big, and really, Mark Webb also showed growing pains when he made the first Amazing Spider-Man movie, but for sure the second one is more of a... It, it has more problems of of the... Mm, what's the word? Of, of the kind of, you know, like, the, the this director wasn't quite ready for, you know, yeah, okay, the the studio wanted him to put in a bunch of things, but you know, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3 is better than The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Not not necessarily by much, because Spider-Man... Yeah, Spider-Man 3 is not that good of a movie, for sure. But Sam Raimi was also under pressure to include a bunch of stuff. And there's a little bit, you know, I... I, I think it's Rod Hilton in his abridged script kind of says, you know, oh, okay, at this point, Sam Raimi just gave up. He doesn't care about the movie anymore. He doesn't care about it making sense, basically. And I, I, there's definitely a sense of that. But Amazing Spider-Man 2 is basically a mess. And it, it is the kind of thing where really, I don't blame Mark Webb. I do think that based on what we've now heard about the the guy who directed Chronicle and Fan Forstick, he does sound like a real jerk. But anyway, Destin Daniel Cretton does an incredible job, and the MCU ones have almost all done incredible jobs. So the movie opens you know, the, the at the very start of the movie, you get a sense of who Wen Wu is and what the Ten Rings can do and how ruthless he is, you know. And let's see. The, I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but, f like... The ending fits, like, I, 
basically the entire third of this movie is kind of its own thing off from and that's you know that's the thing with some of these movies just for a while they get to be like something really unusual for what the for the genre but then the third act comes around and the studio is like you know we're not paying you 200 million so you can make a really big art film right you get that so we're, we're gonna have to just take this over and just make this you know and and honestly i appreciate that at least this time it is very much like again if you're asian i can imagine that like the the mythical elements of the of the movie will really feel you know yeah that that they'll really you know they'll they'll be stuff that you stuff that you you're already somewhat familiar with and that like makes yeah you know you're not used to seeing these folkloric elements on you know a silver screen in you know in a franchise that has grossed such you know huge numbers you know finally there's a movie you can you know direct your western friends to so they can maybe you know like if you if you tell them you'll appreciate my culture way more if you just watch this you know Chinese movie or Korean movie or something and they'll and and they're coming up with excuses for why they're not going to watch that movie this is a movie you can tell them to watch and and they'll you know but yeah the 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 third act I liked it but I can understand those who didn't and it definitely is different from the first two acts but yeah, you know, once the third act, yeah, the ending fits the rest of the third act. Doesn't necessarily fit all of the, yeah, doesn't necessarily fit the first two. I would say I am largely happy with how the movie ends. There's a, I have, I have a few notes, but overall it definitely, yeah. It does not resort to Deus Ex Machina or convenient writing. You know, it's it's stuff that's set up and built up to. It doesn't come out of nowhere. Now. Quoting fellow critics here, directed by Destin Daniel Cretton. The film is somewhat overstuffed and lumpy in parts, and the last, and the, yeah, the last surreal third is poorly knitted into the rest of the narrative. But it's all impossible to predict, and you'll leave the theater satisfied. Each half is solid enough that Shang Chi and the Ten, Legend of the Ten Rings really could have been two separate films: an origin story and its bombastic sequel. And one critic said, the third act is absolutely insane. And the the ending titles are quite... Ah, what's the word? You know, it's a, it's a Marvel movie, so of course we're going to stay through the, the credits. But, yeah, just the, the music playing and, and just, yeah... I would have gladly sat through the end credits even if there hadn't been anything after them. But yes, it has two, you know, it has a mid credit scene and a post credit scene. And you're going to want to watch both of them. The, yeah. Do not leave the theater after the first one is played. You know, there's one that plays 
after the first little bit of end credits, and then there's one that plays after the full end credits. The movie never really loses your interest along the way, although I will say that it definitely did get... The word isn't muddled, but you do feel like... I think, honestly... And that's, again, you know, because it's an MCU movie, there are certain, there are certain, you know, I, th I think the movie would be, would possibly be stronger if less of it was flashback and more of it was just, I'm not saying get rid of the flashbacks, I'm saying let's just have the first chunk of the movie be the backstory and just show it. Don't don't do flashbacks to it. Just show it, and then you know the movie starts. I don't know, thirty or forty minutes. After you know, yeah. You know, maybe maybe leave a little bit of flashback for for a little later in the movie, but you know, but the MCU has certain. There's a certain formula. There are certain demands. You know. And I, th I think they did a pretty good job of making it fit, dis despite that. But a lot of the most interesting stuff in this movie has happened before the events, before the main events of the movie. And, you know, the... Yeah, we're... we're it's interesting to be, to have them retold to us by people who lived through it years earlier. Now, I will say there are parts that are more enjoyable to watch than others. I would definitely say it is worth sitting through the entire movie. You know, I, I mean, if you're watching this, like, let's see. I don't personally, I, I don't think I've ever walked out of a movie theater. The, the... Like, I think I once got out of my seat of a movie theater before the movie was out and, and left the movie, but that was because I accidentally sat in the wrong theater. Other than that, so I'm not saying, you know, leave the theater, but, like, hypothetically, if you're streaming it or, you know, you're, or, or if you're one of the only people in the theater or something, if when the third act starts... If you just feel like, okay, this is not, this is not working for me. I mean, maybe give it five or ten minutes, but if after that you're just like, okay, this is not work, no, this is not working. This is not the movie that I sat down to watch. I, I'm not sure the movie's gonna do very much. You know, yeah. If after ten minutes you're still not really along for the ride. I'm not sure the movie's really going to do anything to to reel you back in and yeah, you know, that is that that's the risk that they took. You know, some people are going to really really hate the the third act. And I don't think that everyone who you know, I th I think some of the people who dislike it are going to be people that it was essentially intended to you know, yeah. Yeah, the third act is in part the way that it is so that it would appeal more to Asian audiences. And I think there are going to be Asian audiences who are going to cringe at it, who are going to be like, no, this is not what we wanted. Please stop doing this, Marvel. This is not where, you know. Again, I'm not trying to speak for them. I'm just saying I, I could imagine that that would be, you know, me... I, I look on YouTube, I look on Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic, if it weren't, you know, if none of those had it, then I don't know it, so. So. I realize that everybody else has already said this, but I do think it bears repeating. I am really, really glad that that the MCU did not try to 
somehow just like tone down and still include the Fu Manchu. I'm really glad that they didn't, you know, they were just like, no, this is, no, no Fu Manchu, we're not, we're not doing that. We're going to do a much more respectful, yeah. Now, let's see, I think the, the movie does do a good job, like the, ah, what's the word? You know, the, the superpowers, it has some really compelling ones. You know, some of them follow the source material closely. The powers are used well, a reasonable amount. It's largely easy to follow what they're, like, doing. And I wouldn't say that there's any that is just used too much. Now. That brings us to the characters. So. First thing I want to say, this is one of those movies where there are characters who've done bad things that the movie, they're not like made out to be the villain and you're, you know, and, yeah, you're essentially asked to empathize with them somewhat. Some people are not going to be able to empathize with them and they're going to find it very frustrating that they're being asked to empathize with characters who've, yeah. Simulu plays Shang-Chi and I see. Yeah, uh, director. Yeah, so the following is from Wikipedia. Director Des Destin Daniel Cretton characterized Shang-Chi as a fish out of water in the US who attempts to hide that with his charisma. And does not know who he really is. And before Simulu was Simulu was cast as Shanchi, he posted to Twitter, "So Marvel, are we going to talk about Shanchi?" Apparently, that wasn't why he was cast. Like. That was apparent, like, I want to say it was Kevin Feige who said, oh, yeah, you know, we, I found out about that after he was cast, you know, but that is really badass. And that is, like, yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's seriously badass. I, I, because he wasn't really, like, you know, he, he was basically doing that as a joke, as if he could, like, throw his weight around, you know, like, make demands like that, you know, he's, he wasn't, this movie, you know, is, is making him a huge deal, but, yeah, it's, it's really, really badass that, yeah. And Aquafina plays Katie, a hotel valet, Shanxi's close friend who's unaware of his past. And let's see. Yeah. Aquafina described Katie as relatable with a real heart, dedication to Shanxi, 
who is thrust into a world where she doesn't really know what to do and is discovering things about herself. And I think this is the first thing I see Aquafina in. You know, some people really can't stand her. Some people really love her. As far as I understand, she to she's toned down in this, like, like, compared to some of the other stuff she's been in, but I, yeah, I thought she was really funny, really charming in this, like, I think there's going, to, you know, as usual, there's going to be, there's going to be people who can't stand her, there's, there's always going to be you know, no matter how good of a job you do with your comic relief character, there's going to be some people who can't stand. I think she's one of my favorite MCU comic relief characters. I, yeah, she, she really very, very charming. Like, you would want her as a friend. You, yeah. Now... And okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try. Ming er, Zhang plays Zha Ling, Shangxi's estranged sister, Wen Bu's daughter. She's really really good. Like there's this kind of stoic, and and just the sense of power. Like I forget. I think Katie, yeah, I, th I think Katie says about her, you have this rock star energy about you. It's badass, so something like that. And yeah, really, like, she, she, some people in the movie's universe consider her to be a really big deal. And I can understand why. Like, the, yeah. And I guess that might be more or less. Yeah, the hmm. Yeah, I'll I'll just real quick say you know Michelle Yo. Jiang Nan, incredible performance. I, I kind of wish she was in more of the movie than she is. I'm not gonna say how much she is in the movie, but yeah, I would have liked more. And I'm really glad. You know, this is another one of those cases. She was, let's see, she played Aleta Ogord in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. I'm glad that the you know, the fact that she played that role didn't mean that she didn't appear in this, because she's, she's so good in this. I, I, yeah. I can't really say a lot about her character without giving too much information, but yeah. And Tony Long as Wenwu. If there was one actor in this movie that, like, like, if you, if you told me you have to recast every role except one. You only get to choose one. Simu Lu would be a close second, and Aquafina a close third, but Tony Lung would be the number one. I he's he's so good in this movie. I have got to watch more of his stuff. I I I'm not sure I'm particularly familiar with his his other work, but absolutely incredible just stunning performance i i it's there's so much where it's like you know that he's he's done some terrible things but you can really understand him like it i'm i'm not saying that you approve of the things or accept the things you like you you want him to stop but he's not like this monster that just and and sometimes it's actually 
it's not even just that, you know, oh, you know, he can be really charming. No, like, there are times where he'll do something terrible, and you're sitting there like, oh, please stop doing that. Please do not. Please stop doing that. But you you still understand, like, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a great performance. And, and strong writing as well. Like, I, I can understand why, like, Tony Long, you know, like, he doesn't need to, to, you know, it, he has credentials. He doesn't, he doesn't need to, to say, oh, you know, I did a Marvel movie once. Maybe that will make you more interested in hiring me for, in casting me for this particular, you know, he, he doesn't need this. He's here because he finds the material compelling and you can understand why it really is like, yeah. Now, let's see. Yes, yeah, so the, yeah, producer Jonathan Schwartz said that when Wu was a more complex and layered character than the comic book version, and I, I can imagine, you know, I, I praise a lot of comic books. Occasionally, some of them are like, okay, that, that could be a bit better, but yeah. And... And uh, Destin Daniel Cretton uh, felt Lung avoided Asian stereotypes in a one-dimensional portrayal by bringing humanity and love to the role. And it's 100% true. It, I couldn't have put it better myself, which is why I didn't. Absolutely 100%. Like, you you really... Like, this is... This is the kind of villain acting that, like, you know, decades ago, studios would have been like, you cannot do that. We're gonna, we're gonna get... Demo the, we're gonna get destroyed by the censors. The censors are gonna, like... They're gonna they're gonna say that we didn't make the villain bad enough. They're gonna th they're gonna think that audiences are gonna go away from the movie and be like, you know, the the villain was actually kind of appealing, and we're gonna get destroyed because of it. And it just it's it's yeah. I I'm so many of the things that he he does. You know he's does he's done so many such terrible things, but you you yeah you can understand you know it's like in real life it is complex you know many people you know there's there's someone who is or has been in our lives someone that we you know maybe loved that we can recognize they've done some terrible things and it's not necessarily not everybody deserves forgiveness you know but i i i really appreciate that in a movie with you know these really far out fantasy elements i'm not saying that's a bad thing there's also room for something so realistic. Like, the movie doesn't make excuses for Wen Wu. But it also doesn't pretend that he's, like, inhuman. He's not, he's not a... Just a, a monster with absolutely no redeeming qualities. Yeah, he's, he's incredibly compelling. And... You know, Andre from Black Nerd Comedy said that this movie is as much Wen Wu's story as it is Sean Chi's, and he's right, and and the movie is better for it. And Accented Cinema said that Tony Lung is an actor who acts with his eyes, and you definitely see that here. Like it's he can communicate more with his eyes than some actors can with their entire body and if they're talking and like just 
it's it's unreal how much like yeah I, I you know the the I can only assume that like demo reel footage of Tony Lung's acting is like something that aspire you know some aspiring actors like try to I guess not not quite imitate but like they they set that as as a as a goal you know if 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 I can express as much emotion a, a tenth as much emotion with my eyes as Tony Lung can you know then that's that's yeah, we're we're on our way. Now let's see the Right. Shang-Chi is effective because the stakes remain relatively small. It is essentially a family melodrama. 100%. And it works so unbelievably well. Like, you know, this again, like, if before I knew anything about this movie, if you just, you know, asked, what would you be more excited to see? Like, you know, cool martial arts fights or family melodrama. You know, I would almost definitely have, yeah, I would have said martial arts. You know, I'm really passionate about martial arts, but in this movie, like, I was never, it's not like I was ever bored during the martial arts fights, but like, scenes of family melodrama, like, really hit, like, you really, it's, it's deeply compelling. I, I did not think that, I would not have thought, I, I had read that, you know, it's, it's a strong mellow care, yeah, family melodrama, so I was kind of primed for it, I, I was still surprised by how good it was, but, yeah, you know, this is, this is why, You know, a, a story like this can be told to a huge audience as long as there's also, you know, martial arts and, and mythical elements and all this other stuff. You know, $200 million budget. Now, the movie does a good job of, you know, some, some of the characters, we see them in tremendously varied circumstances. We see what they're like when things are going well, how they respond to things going wrong. And let's see the yeah. So the cinematography was handled by Bill Pope, although in the end credits he was credited as credited as William Pope. So I I don't know if. Maybe there are too many Bill Popes and he's trying, and it's a way for him to, anyway. He was the cinematographer on, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to go through the most notable of these. Alita Battle Angel, Men in Black 3, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, The Spirit. Look, I'm not saying it's a good movie. But if you just pay attention to the, the cinematography, that's actually pretty good. Yeah, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie. Oh, huh, not Sam Raimi Spider-Man 1. Okay, fair enough. The Matrix trilogy, Bound, Army of Darkness, and Darkman. You know, he's unbelievably talented. And yeah, he brings all of his talent to this movie. And it works unbelievably well, like the the camera 
isn't just showing these fights, which uh, the fights are incredible on their own, but no, the camera is like dancing around itself. It's like the the action scenes in this movie. It's maybe not all of them equally, but several of the major action scenes in this movie, like you can show as like this is. Again, this is what to aspire to for cinematography, for, for a cinematographer. It's absolutely incredible. And this was edited by Elizabeth Ronalds Dottier, who also edited Deadpool 2. Nat Sanders, who edited yeah, you know, Nat is basically the director's ongoing editor. You know, Just Mercy, The Glass Castle, and Short Term 12. So, yeah. And Harry Yoon, who I, I'm not familiar with any of his work. But, yeah, it's incredibly well edited. Like, the... There are several bits where, like, lesser editors would have spent, you know, they would have lingered, they would have spent too much time before moving on, and it doesn't move too fast. Now, let's see. The special effects were quite good. Like, there's definitely a little bit of it that's like, okay, not com not one hundred percent convincing, but the the yeah, I'm gonna quote a fellow critic here. The production design of Talo is really beautiful to look at. Of course, Marvel Studios used their Marvel money to make the setting stand out. I can't say it is Black Panther impressive, but it was good nonetheless. And, yeah, very much so. The stunt work is incredible. Like, there's, yeah, there's some absolutely absurd stunts in this. And, and for sure, at least some of it, they must have, like, they can't have filmed it exactly the way it looks. There must be, like, some special effects wizardry or something, but, yeah. Now, so some of the, yeah, the, the, for the, for the martial arts, they kind of tried to just get all of the, especially like, fun and and memorable like you know you have wire foo there's some stuff that's very jackie chan you know there's something that's right out of crouching tiger hidden dragon like it's a movie that wants to pay tribute and does an incredible job paying tribute to all the like major asian cinema, uh, action cinema, I should say, uh, not, not all of Asian cinema, but the, and, and especially martial arts based action, Asian cinema, you know, yeah, they, they try to, to pay tribute to all of them in, in this sort of recognition, you know, the, the way that like, yeah, in, in recognition of the fact that if not for all this artistry in all these decades of movie making, this movie would not be, you know, if, if, if there wasn't, they're, they're standing on the shoulders of giants, basically, you know, the, similar to how like Black Panther, you know, you've got the, the reference to Oh, actually, thinking about it, I guess that's technically a spoiler. Well, 
Okay, I can mention a different one. In in Black Panther, you have a reference to the first Captain America movie with, you know, a, a grenade going off and, like, absorbing the blast the way that Steve Rogers did in, uh, yeah, or, yeah, thought he was doing to a dummy grenade. Even the film's fight sequences bristle with emotion, as acts of flirtation, rage, or even love. Absolutely perfectly put. So, yeah, the, the action includes chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, martial arts. Now, the... should probably try to hurry up at least a little bit. Some people say that the, let's see, I think it was, right, it was one, actually, yeah, just briefly want to say the, you know, Wen Wu is very memorable and honestly very charismatic at times. I'm afraid I did not know exactly who it was but one of the red carpets you know for the premiere one of the people making the movie said that Wen Wu is the most complex villain of the MCU which you know immediately made me you know more so than than even Thanos and I don't know if I completely agree but the the He's up there. He's he's close. And yeah, it really is. I guess I guess in some ways he is more complex than than Thanos actually. Yeah. So Wenwu is literally the single most long anticipated MCU villain so far of the ones the films told us we would see. He was promised to us way back in the first Iron Man movie and only now, 13 years later, does he actually appear in his true form. I mean, even Thanos, we only had to wait six years for and he made a bunch of appearances in those six years. Obviously, for some people, it's not going. To, it's it's going to have been. It's it's going to be too little, too late. And I wouldn't personally say that I was as. I mean, when when we first saw Thanos proper in Infinity War, part of it was you know in addition to having us having waited for so long, it's that immediately like he's. You know, he's introduced as being so unbelievably strong and powerful, and he's working on assembling the Infinity Gauntlet, something that, you know, the MCU has left a trail of breadcrumbs and let, you know, little hints throughout the, the, you know, yeah, so, so, No, he's, he's, Wen Wu is incredibly compelling, and yeah, I'm, I'm really, really glad that he's such a big part of this movie. And his, you know, some, some of the best movies ever made have a really compelling relationship between the villain and the protagonist, and yeah, this one has that, like, the, the relationship between... Like, for so much of the movie, it really is this thing. Like, a lot of superhero movies, it's this thing of, you know, the hero's like, can I do this? You know, will I, you know, will I, do I risk losing myself if I go too far in trying to fight this, this enemy? But here, it's literally like, it's his own father. And... 
there is some chance that Wenwu is just too powerful to to stop at all and just yeah there's just there's so much there and and i know some some reviewers thought that Simu, uh, yeah i'm not sure it was Simuzu in particular i think it was just Shang-Chi, you know the the writing and such they didn't think he was a compelling enough character i disagree i think he is a very compelling character and he's there's more to him than you might think at first like there was there was something that is only revealed a fair bit into the movie that i thought made him more interesting i already thought he was interesting but it made him even more so and yeah you know when wu's plan makes sense and that's a good thing and shon chi's plan makes sense and that's a good thing now Yeah, so the music and score was handled by Joel P. West, who also did the music for Just Mercy, The Glass Castle, Short Term 12, and I Am Not a Hipster, so basically the director's ongoing composer. I think he did an incredible job. The The music is really, really solid. But both the the composed score and the, the like... Uh, yeah, I'm not Are there licensed songs in this? I'm not 100% sure. The, you know, original songs were made for this. And, yeah, some, some really, really great stuff. And, yeah, I already talked about the comedy being really great. I I had been a little worried that the um, there would be too much comic relief. I was you know, I yeah. I think this movie does much fares much better than Black Widow with Alexei. Again, I don't care that it's the one man in the women driven film that that it's the one man being the butt of so many jokes i just don't like for one character to be the butt of so many jokes and yeah like in this it that wasn't the case now let's see the this is one of the movies where you need to suspend disbelief to enjoy it. The laws of physics do not always apply. And, yeah, hypothetically, maybe part of the movie is, in fact, set in a world where the rules are just different from our own. So, yeah, that's if, if that's going to bother you, this is not a movie for you. Now, the pacing is a bit of a mixed, uh, yeah, like it doesn't, it's not completely smooth. There's definitely some issues here and there. Now... So, yeah, I would say the, the best element of the movie is the, the Asian flavor. You know, once again, of course, viewed through a very Western lens, the movie is still made in a way to mainly appeal to a typical Westerner, but way too many MCU movies lack a distinct personality of their own, and this one definitely has that. 
And I'd say it's worth watching at least once in theaters just to experience that. The worst aspect of the movie is the the constraints of the MCU formula, and the the how 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 yeah the third act isn't bad on its own, but the the how different it is from the first two, and it is one of those things you know if if you go into the movie knowing that you know lowering your expectations that that helps a lot ultimately i don't think it's that big of a deal now the the thing i was most worried about was the the mcu formula taking a lot of the most interesting elements out entirely or at least watering them down somewhat and the movie exceeded my expectations. And let's see, I was most looking forward to the the very specific Asian like cultural elements, for example, and the movie exceeded my expectations. The trailers give way too much, but with that said. There's definitely a lot of stuff you haven't seen. I, th I think they did an incredible job hiding a lot of... I, I don't know if they thought that it would drive people away from theaters than, instead of into theaters, or if they legitimately felt like, well, let's keep some secrets, but... Yeah. Now... The trailers do give you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the trailers, you'll like the movie. If you don't, you're less likely to like the movie. And let's Um, so, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has, oh, I guess actually, yeah, this is out there. Yeah, I'll, I'll just real quick open it on the, on the small phone, so that you can get the most, oh, that's right, the, let's see. There's no actual Rotten Tomatoes app, so you just have to open the website on a browser. So I'll do that real quick. Yeah, I already have it. So I just gotta find the specific movie. Ninety-two percent on the tomato meter, with two hundred sixty-three reviews counted. So it is certified fresh, and ninety-eight percent audience score, based on over ten thousand verified ratings. So the critics' consensus is Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings is an entirely free of Marvel's familiar formula, but this exciting origin expands the MCU in more ways than one. And the audience says Shang Chi covers new cultural ground for the MCU without losing any of the action, comedy, and emotion Marvel's movies are known for. Now, let's see. The... I also... Yeah, there's also Metacritic. I'll just real quick. Yeah, it's... Not take many moments to open, and... I just got... Uh, let's see. Okay, it has a 71 out of 100 based on 51 reviews, and 7.6 out of 10 based on 226 ratings. Now, the... 
I forgot to put the number if I'm pretty sure there's over a hundred Metacritic user reviews and the IMDB rating is there it is 8.0 out of 10 based on almost 50,000 votes the movie isn't especially violent although the there are a few bits that are kind of yeah kind kind of violent and it's the you know it's PG-13 they get away with it because they don't look enough like human beings it's it's wild like a few decades back that wasn't enough you know you couldn't show something extreme just as long as it's not happening to something that looks like a human body or as long as you don't see too much viscera and blood but anyway this is capital C cinema and I recommend this movie to fans of the MCU and fans of movies that focus on Asian culture and you know once again like it is it is basically it works as a standalone movie like if you if you know someone that you you really want them to get into Asian culture even if they've never watched another Marvel movie, like, you can have them just watch this. You know, it's only... I forget the exact... Actually, I think I might have it here. Two hours and 12 minutes, you know. You don't actually need to have watched any of the, the rest of the MCU. You know, just... There's stuff that has more of an impact if you have but you know if if yeah and yeah so i i would say that this is a good solid nine pasts confronted out of ten and yeah just real brief for it to be a perfect ten for one thing the the flashback yeah I'm I, I don't blame you know that's basically because it has to fit into the formula but I do think it would have the movie would have hit harder if more of the story had been like told in chronological order and then you know just a few flashbacks and if the i love the first two acts and i love the third act but i cannot claim that they go together all that well you know the the yeah the first two acts go together with each other well but the third act feels like a different movie, you know, and yeah. But hey, 9 out of 10 ain't bad. That brings us to the spoiler section. Thought section start. Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it's very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes have to do during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie will be in this section. So yeah, once again, from here on out, I am no longer warning before I spoil things about this movie. Or, you know, anything in the MCU that, you know, that's out by now. I guess, technically, I won't. 
I mean, I guess I technically, I kind of already did spoil the, at least a little bit of the most recent What If episode, which came out after this movie premiered. So, anyway. So, let's see. The... The rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it's analysis, some of it's MST3K riff tracks and other jokes. Now time codes for other sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts I have while watching, in front of which order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. The section after that is thoughts I had before watching. Now, let's see. Yeah, so... Does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? I'm not sure there's a single character in this that the movie has no empathy for. Like, yeah, I'm I'm not sure who that would be. The the like, I I was surprised when Razor Fist like, yeah, started helping the. But yeah, there you go. And when Wu, <clears throat> I suppose the movie does not have empathy for, let's see, what was it? The, the dweller in the darkness and the soul suckers. But other than that, and, and I do think, you know, they kind of needed to be just pure evil for, for that to work. But yeah, I really appreciate that it has empathy for everyone else. And it, it is, like, ah, let me think, what's the word? Usually, I'm, I'm passionate about when one of these movies has the, the world-ending thing, you know. And this is one of the ones where, like, once Wen Wu himself was dead, I wasn't really, like, he, you know, it was fascinating to see him versus the, the good guys, but when, without him, like, it just wasn't, you know, yeah, uh, you know, after his death, there was still the threat to the world because it's one of these movies, you know, they feel like they have to have that in there, and you know, sometimes the movies do an incredible job of making, like, movies like Captain America the Winter Soldier, Black Panther the solo movie, you know, there's such a, an, a personal and emotional connection between the hero and villain. And, you know, when their fight is over, the overall movie is over, you know, that's, that's it. But in this one, you know, I, I'm not sure there was really anything they could do. You know, I, I tried to kind of imagine, well, what if, what if they, like, what, what if, what if the, the dweller in the darkness sort of took over Wenwu? Would that be, no, that still doesn't, because, because then the, that's, then that's what the conflict is, you know, yeah. Let's see, I appreciate that the movie, you know, several of the major characters, several of the strongest characters are women. You know, this is like, they're, they're they, yeah, they did a good job with Black Panther as well. You know, obviously it's a huge deal to get a black man and an Asian man to headline one of these movies, but let's not let's not let it end there let's try to go a little further and yeah you know both of them there are multiple strong women you know in black panther who are black in this movie who are asian you know like katie is comic relief for a lot of it but she's not like stupid or weak or something and she saves the day there at the end you know and like I'm afraid I, I, I'm blanking on their, their names, but Shang-Chi's sister and mother are some of the biggest badasses in the movie. Like, I really, really, 
I would have loved to see way more of Michelle Yeoh in this movie. And I really, really hope they, I mean, they have to. They said the Ten Rings will return. The Ten Rings led by the sister? Holy, holy crap. That's going to be so, I, I cannot wait. I, oh, absolutely stoked. I, I, yeah. These were, these were two of the best like mid credits and post credit scenes in a long time for these. Now, let's see. I think they did a good job not overexposing like the Dweller in the Darkness, you know, didn't have too much screen time. It didn't have so much screen time that we just got used to it. And then there was the yeah, what was the other thing? Yeah, you know, Death Dealer and Razor Fist and the and the Ten Rings themselves. The you know, they're not just like constantly you know constantly seeing a lot of use so that the audience is eventually I have to admit, Death Dealer, I really felt like he could have been in the movie considerably more. Like so little screen like almost all the Actually, was there a single, like, Death Dealer dies there at the end at the hands of the Soul Suckers. Yeah, I, th I think every single thing that Death Dealer, every scene that Death Dealer is in was shown in the trailers. Yeah, I, I but I really, I, I, I did like Death Dealer and Razor Fist and, and the Ten Rings. I do think it's a little unfortunate that, like, so now the Ten Rings is the organization, but it's also the actual rings. Like, I think it would have been really great if they had come out with come come up with just a slightly some something to differentiate them when you're verbally talking about you know, cause yeah. I mean, is if I understand correctly in the comics. The organization isn't called the Ten Rings. That's just, you know, when in the comics, when you use the phrase the Ten Rings, you're referring to the 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 actual rings and, and the powers they hold. But anyway. Yeah, I, I don't think I put it anywhere in my handwritten notes. So I'll just say here, I really liked seeing the the sort of like for so much of the movie, it's, you know, when Wu uses the, the Ten Rings, you know, yeah, they're, they're the, the most powerful weapon he has. I guess the only weapon he personally wields. And, yeah, you know, when he tried to use them against the woman that he then goes on to marry... Like, which also, I love their fight because there was this sense of flirtation. Like, she's not trying to, like, murder him or destroy him or, like, you know, break some bones. No, she's flirting, clearly. And, and he flirts back. And and that was really, really nicely, yeah. And, and, like, you know, their fight ends and she, like, you know, she throws him into the water, and then she's just gone as just a sort of, like, you're not going to win. You can't defeat me. I am stronger than you are. So, you know, when he comes back, you know, he's he's not coming back to, like, you know, it's not it's not a rematch. It's a date. It's It's a second date, you might even say, because that first, you know, yeah. And, and that is, and, and that's also, like, that is some, some people who live their lives wielding a lot of violence, the one thing that appeals to them is when someone is, you know, is equally skilled. And, and, yeah. But, you know, she, he used the, the rings to try to defeat her, and she defeated him. And so, you know, Shang-Chi's aunt, the mother's sister, teaches him 
since she also knows that, you know, it's it's what they use in Talo, is that how you pronounce it? I I warned you, I'm almost definitely mispronouncing. But yeah, the 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 dimension that they yeah. And the the let's see. Yeah, I, I really, I thought that worked really well. And, you know, it's this, this thing of like, he's, he's taking over some of his father's power, you know, the, the rings switching hands or arms as it were. It's not the most subtle metaphor you've ever seen, but it works, you know, and it is like, we have a lot of stories like this, but that's because these are stories that are important to tell. You know, the, the, there are a lot of people who have, ah, what's the word? Like ex experiences with, ab about their, their parents where, you know, in, in part the movie is about abuse by your parents you know shang chi was pushed to be an assassin his sister was basically ignored you know th these are incredibly harmful you know when wu is responsible for a lot of trauma and movies like this are a way to help deal with real life trauma you know in real life you know, most of us are not, you know, the, most of us don't have parents who are actually, you know, crime lords and, and, but a lot of people have parents who, you know, sometimes make mistakes. And, yeah, you know, this... This is a good way to try to, to cope. And that brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. So I like how we open on the origin of the Ten Rings with the horseman. I completely blanked on bringing it up in the review itself, but I really like that straight up when it, a lot of the time that it makes sense to characters will speak Mandarin Chinese to each other, you know, like, cause it's a Chinese woman talking to her small Chinese son. Why would she be speaking English? Like, what would... Be, they live in China. They're Chinese. There's no reason for them to be speaking English. Like, and, and you know, honestly, some, I, some, some people are gonna bail right there. Like, the very first lines are spoken in Mandarin Chinese. And, like, is it maybe a good five or ten minutes before any English is actually spoken and and there are chunks of the movie where people speak in Mandarin Chinese and yeah I, I really like that stylistic choice we're told that the rings were found similar to how you know yeah in the in the comics there are a couple of different versions cuts comics and I love comic books I can't even anyway I think it was Movie Bob who brought up Shang-Chi and Eternals are being released, you know, not very far apart. There's ten magic rings. In some of the comics, they're from outer space. There's ten Eternals. The Eternals have been on Earth for thousands of years. You know, maybe, maybe the rings come contain parts of them and I would definitely say the the post credits uh, mid, mid credits I guess mid credits scene 
I definitely got that sense that that's where they're going with this. You know, that's why, like, you know, the, they can't recognize it as an earth metal, you know, Carol says she, it doesn't look like anything she's encountered in outer space, so, yeah. I appreciate, you know, a movie that has so much, like, talking and explaining about things and, and flashbacks and such. We open on a proper action scene, you know, you really, you see Wen Wu really kicking ass of, of this army using the, the rings. And... I, I like the bit where we see, you know, he's... He gets to the, the entrance of the... Yeah. You know, where, where the... What's it called? Yeah, so that little area, you know, and the forest seems to attack, you know, and in reality, I guess it's not that there's a real, if I understood it correctly, it's basically, it's just always shifting like a, like a maze. It's not that there's a real, they're not like aiming for anyone. They're just all, it's just always moving. I really love the the fight in the forest, just amazing choreography and cinematography. But that really, I actually, I wrote, I noted that for every single fight, you know, amazing choreography and amazing cinematography. And Now, what on earth did I write there? Hmm. Oh, right, right, yeah. Um, It was not subtle, but I did think that the scene of, you know, the, the, um, the lawyer friend, you know, talking to, to Shanxi and Katie about how, you know, like she, she essentially says, maybe you should, maybe you two should grow up, you know, it's, it's, it's a little, you know, you're in, like, you're, I mean, let's see. He must be in his 20s at least, right? Because, let's see, it was like 96, he was little, and then it's 21 years, 25 years later. Oh, wait, never mind, I guess maybe he's 30 or so. Anyway, yeah. You know, the, the lawyer is like, it's it's time to, you know, and I really like the bit with, oh, you know, she was in the car. I was in the backseat. Yeah, that's, that's part of the car. But, yeah, you know, basically, like, the movie needs to put, you know, it's important for both Katie and Shang-Chi to feel like, you know, they're they're not fulfilling their potential and the movie you know it's like um we have a lot to get to you guys so like we don't really if, I, I i don't think you can read this clock face from from there but uh the time is time to get the plot moving we don't have that long to to establish all these things let's let's you know but it, it worked i thought the 
and the the bit of karaoke was both sweet and and funny and yeah and i like the you know the movie doesn't bring attention to it but like I th let's see it's when it's when shon chi gets to you know he's he's going to go pick up katie and like on the on the outside of the building there's this you know thing that says post blip anxiety you're not alone which i i really like these subtle little touches of, of that and the you know we see that the family is also pressuring you know katie for you know future stuff and and She's actually also being pressured to, like, wait, wait, was it her or was it him? I forget which of them, met, was it? Possibly both. You know, there was pressure to, for, the, for them to get married and all this stuff, yeah. And the, the bus fight was also just incredible. Like, I, I, the, the, um, what's the word? I thought they did a good job of this, like, basically, you you didn't see, like, you know, if we watched the trailers. The moment I saw the bus, I was like, okay, this is the bus fight. But I didn't realize that it was going to, ah, what's the word? You know, the, the I, I thought they did a good job of like the the guys who who start the fight. You know, like at first they look like just regular bus passengers. You know, and then the yeah, you know they they start they they try to pressure Shang Chi. And actually, I thought it was a, a clever, like, we again see Katie try to, like, try to, yeah, try to try to get out of the situation without Shonshi fighting because she thinks he can't. And, like, that thing that they, they talk about in the, you know, where, like, the, the high school thing... If she hadn't gone in and and prevented the fight, there's some chance that Shang Chi would have just mopped the floor with this other guy. You know, depending on who you know, if he was a teenager. Teenagers aren't really known for, a, a, you know, a lot of restraint. You know, and he he could have defeated this guy. You know, we we. We see in the bus scene, you know, because he was an incredible fighter back then as well. So, yeah. Now. Yeah, and we're told that shang -Chi ran away from home when he was 14 years old. I, I, if I... If I were to defend some of the the uh, flashback stuff, I did think it worked well that, you know, first you're told, you know, oh, he ran away from home at age 14. And we're told, you know, oh, his sister, he abandoned his sister when he was 14. And I forget, I'm not 100% sure what the age difference is, but he is older than her. So... She wasn't even 14 when, yeah, and, and then we're later told, you know, at first, Sean, she claims to Katie, he left, you know, instead of killing the, the man who killed his mother, but then later he admits he did kill him, you know, and that was, yeah. Now, and, and the, the... Macau, I think the city at night looked incredible. 
and I have to admit the whole the the fighting tournament bit. I don't mind that his sister runs the thing, and I don't mind that she wants to kick his ass. I do think this thing of like it was kind of contrived. This thing of like he, you know. In part, it's there so that they can put Wong and Abomination fighting in the trailer and get everyone talking. You know, for, for at, at first, some people were like, that can't be Wong. Why would Wong be in a fighting tournament? And then, you know, you watch the movie. I mean, it seems like they're making some easy money like that. You know, in in Infinity War, Doctor Strange points out you, you need money to, to buy food. And you just don't have any money here, you know. So, I I could imagine that like Stephen was like, okay, so we got to figure out some way to, you know, to to make money. I am not. We are not doing balloon animals. I will not let Tony, you know, be right about that. So, let's see. I personally like being the center of attention. If you do something impressive, people really like it. Uh, we're good at fighting. Let's do that, you know. I mean, we, we even see, like, they're on first name bait, or at least, well, yeah, we don't hear Abomination say anything. That was a little weird for me. I, I mean, didn't, didn't they get... Is, isn't he still doing the mocap, uh, uh, the actor? I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. I, I really love his work. Mr. Orange. Um, yeah. Cannot recall his name right now. Anyway. But, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure I read that he returned for mocap. So, anyway. But, you know, Wong specifically says, Emil, that hurt. You want to know how much it hurt, and then he makes the portal so that he p punches himself. I was pretty funny. And he's like, see, I told you, you need to learn to throw your punches, you know. Because if you if you knew how to throw, throw a punch, you wouldn't have just punched yourself in the face like that, you know. So was... Wong was the just the absolute champ at stop hitting yourself. Now... But but yeah, you know, the whole the whole fighting tournament it felt kind of contrived. Not that it existed at all, because that makes sense for her to do to to run that tournament. And I get why she wanted to kick his ass and do it in front of everyone. But he he agrees to fight some stranger to, uh, I get it. I get it. The reason he agrees is because he thinks that his sister is in mortal jeopardy. He doesn't know that she's a fighter. And that was also a good reveal. And it's too bad that it's in the trailers. I, I, it would have been great if we had no idea that she could fight before watching the movie. If we thought... And actually, yeah, come to think of it, because we saw, right? If I recall... Oh, wait, was that... Was the flashback where we see that she learned to fight even though she wasn't allowed to? That might have been after that. Anyway, he agrees because he thinks it's the only way he's going to be able to save her life. I'm not saying... Look, I do that in the same situation. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the, the screenwriters really had to contrive a situation in order to get him into this fight. And it just... Yeah. And that was also something like, you know, when, if you go back and watch videos of people picking apart the trailer, they were like, why is he in a fighting tournament all of a sudden? I, I guess maybe some of them had theories. I forget. It's been a while. Now. And I mean, at the end of the day, we don't really, we don't even really need the fighting tournament in there. It's it's there so that we can see that she can fight really well. You know, I'm, I mean... Let's see. I, I want to say 
his name is Oliver Harper. He just released a teaser for he's apparently doing a video on the uh, Jean Claude Van Damme Street Fighter movie, and you know he plays several clips from behind the scenes stuff, and one of them has someone saying you know. So people obviously expected the movie to have a fighting tournament. You know, I know I you know if if you if you wrote a bit of of like fighting tournament into your martial arts movie, and then you like lost the page to the wind. I know where it landed. See, I I gotta admit, at first, I got real like Hulk versus Thor and Ragnarok vibes, like. Why are they fighting? I do not understand why they're fighting. It's cool. It's cool looking, but I don't understand why they're doing it. But yeah, you you really understand once, yeah. And you know, she she says that thing about you know he said he'd be back. What was it in three days? And then that became a month and six years. Uh, within six years, I you know I I decided I could I had to move on. You know, I had I had to take care of myself, something like that. Now, and yeah, so the yeah, you know the Shon Chi is is confused and asks, well, "Why did you send the postcard then?" And she's like, "I didn't send the postcard." I mentioned in the review that there was something I saw. When they were fighting, I thought to myself, she didn't send the postcard. This was a trap. You know, someone else sent the post. And when I realized that, then the moment that Wen Wu said, I know that this will work because your mother told me so. You know, I hear her voice from the beyond. The moment that he said that, I was like, that's not actually her voice. He's being tricked. Somebody else setting a trap, luring him in, you know, foreshadowing. And again, I still really love the, those twists, but, and I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not really criticizing the movie. I, I, I like good foreshadowing, and I do think it's, uh, yeah. Now, yeah, I really like the action scene where they're like on the, uh, what are those called? Like on the outside of the building and there's this construction thing, you know, and right, I, I thought the movie did a good job in the, at least in the first third, possibly also the second third, I, I'm not 100%, but not so much in the third third, but yeah, in the first third, like, the moment that we see Shang-Chi fight, even what, like, the, when the bus scene, when the fight starts, and he's just, you know, mopping the floor with these guys, immediate, immediately, it's like, okay, this is cool looking, but where's the tension? And the movie solves that immediately by putting innocence in danger. So the tension is maybe Shang-Chi won't be able to save everyone. You know, that's the thing we're worried about. Because we're not worried that he's going to lose the fight. That's that's not something we're worried about once... Like, the, the only fight I thought that he might lose was against his father. Other than... And, you know, turned out he also lost against the sister, but I didn't see that one coming. But yeah, you know, you'd have innocent civilians, you'd have Katie in danger. I like the tense family dinner. And let's see. Yeah, we get the flashback where they talk about that, you know, Wenwu and, 
Shon Chi's mom basically gave up everything so that they could be together. You know, the the flashback, and then you have them like I I'm. I think it's like a video game console thing or something. They were like dancing on on this mat thing. Uh, um, it's not the thing that's called Dance Dance Revolution. I'm pretty sure, but it's that kind of game. I think, and and like I think it's when Wu like tries covering her eyes, so you know. And and they're smiling and just it's is really really sweet. It was very very heartwarming and just yeah the the you know the fact that you know they used to be that happy and then she died and it destroyed the family and just you know yeah those acts of God really do ah crap. I think I know the rest of the quote. I swear I won't spend forever trying to recall. Okay, never mind. I do not recall how the rest of that quote goes, but yeah. And... Yeah, when Wu says that you know his his wife is through the the door in ta talao and the yeah you know he thinks that he can hear her she's being held captive in there and you know, yeah, at, th at this point, I noted, so, when Wu sent killers at Shang-Chi and his sister, but he didn't want them dead, and it's basically, like, I mean, he says, I never lost track of my kids, and I'm not sure, yeah, I mean, he, it seems like, I, I could imagine that, that, that seems like it's true, yeah. I mean, I guess basically, so he, he doesn't think that they're going to give the pendants willingly, and he thinks that the pendants, you know, if he doesn't get the pendants, he won't be able to get his wife back to, to bring her back to life yeah I mean yeah it's it's a it's good writing it's clever because that right there tells you you know you you don't you don't realize it when you first you know when when there's a guy with a machete for an arm you know chopping a bus in half you don't know what's going on but then you know once he has both pendants and then he puts it in the you know thing and he gets the map, you know, you realize he literally is willing for his children to die as long as he can get his wife back. And that is, that's, that's part of his character. He is, he is willing for them to die if he can just get his wife back. And, you know, he, he says, I, I told my killers that if they tried killing you, they wouldn't, you know, yeah, they wouldn't be able to kill you. I'm glad they that I was right. He, do, he doesn't say that, like, yeah, I mean, I'm glad that I was right. That means he is at least slightly surprised. Yeah, I said that that would be the case, but I wasn't entirely sure. And let's see, the... Right, and, and yeah, so they, the, the, um, uh, Shang-Chi and Katie end up in a cell, and then they find 
Trevor, who doesn't know what year it is. And we meet Morris. I knew it was called Morris. I didn't know why. But, yeah, like I, I don't know exactly what... I, I figure Trevor probably named it after a specific, like, person or thing or something. But, yeah, Morris, that is, a, you know, an English name. And, and I really, like... You know, he's like... If you you just have to follow Morris's directions, he says there is a ninety percent chance that he can get you through alive. Oh wait, never mind, nineteen percent. Wow, that's and considering that Morris's directions are the way they're gonna get through, and Trevor just had he's been speaking to it for years. But he just had trouble discerning if it was 90 or 19. Now, the, the car chase as they're getting out of the, the Ten Rings base, I got a real Children of Men vibe, that, that long take, where, you know, where they spit the... the um, the ball back and forth, you know, and yeah, like that's a that's a good place to to take some inspiration if that is what they did, and yeah, it was it was really really cool. And the scene of driving through the maze was very tense, and and all the stuff with the Planet of the Apes, nineteen sixty eight, so. You became an actor because uh, I couldn't believe if, if monkeys could act that well, what could I do, you know? So, uh, today you know that the those weren't actually monkeys riding horses. No, no, I, I know. I, they were just monkeys acting like they could ride horses. I, I still can't wrap my head around it. If Trevor Slattery starts just appearing in like every three MCU movies, I'm down for it. I, I, it's, it's, yeah, he's just, he's so unbelievably funny. Now, so yeah, they get to Ta Lo. And what does that Morris helps? Oh, right, right. Yeah, the the you know Morris knows the way to Tatlo. But when Wu wouldn't listen to this fanciful creature or to Trevor because he thinks that they're beneath him. And, you know, because of that, he actually, he, he could have gotten there any time, you know, as, yeah. And I like the, you know, the ant almost immediately like she's like you know they're, they're like oh but you know he's he's hearing her when Wu is hearing his wife's voice is he wearing the rings you know just immediately she's like oh yeah I I think I know I I think I might know what's going on here and just yeah and she tells us about the dweller in darkness so you know the Dweller in Darkness is introduced at the start of the final third of the movie, and then we only see it at the very end of the final third of the movie. But yeah, you know, and it is that thing, like, I I, I read at least one reviewer who said, you know, I like the movie so much more when it had personal stakes, but not world-ending stakes. And it is this thing of, like, 
I, I, I can imagine that the Dweller in Darkness is a, like, and some, some Asian folkloric, you know, m monster, you know, but, so, so, you know, so if you, if you know those folklore stories, you know, you, you understand the idea of why it's doing what it's doing and how it's going to do it, but, I'm, and I'm not saying that, like, I would I would rather be confused and have movies that have inclusion than you know for every movie to I don't want every movie to cater to me but yeah you know as a as a westerner I just sit back I you know okay so if the toiler in darkness gets a you know gets out it's going to be unstoppable you know if it if it's yeah like I I think one of them said everything will die or something like that and you know they talk about oh if it if it swallows the soul of the dragon it'll be unstoppable and i i don't need much but i just like i'm i'm immediately i'm like what what is it going what does it stand to gain by killing everyone it, again you don't need to give me much and exactly how is it going to like just I mean, is it going to go around individually killing everything, or is it going to be a thing that spreads? Like, I don't, I don't need much. It's just these are these are questions that I really, really wanted answered. And if if the if they could just put a thing out before the movie count premiered, a Disney Plus, just you know, here's a here's just just a few important things to know about, like. Chinese folklore or something before you watch Shang-Chi because it's just I, I I don't blame them for not answering those questions in in the movie anyway but yeah you know the ant explains that a voice from in there promises those who have the ten rings <clears throat> you know if exactly what they want if they are freed and you need the ten rings in order to be able to get yeah so so that was a really clever and it's you know the movie doesn't really put too fine of a point on it i i kind of would have liked for them to dive a little deeper but yeah like the ten rings are his greatest strength and his greatest weakness I thought that was a a really clever like cuz cuz he doesn't he doesn't realize that. He, you know, Sean she specifically, you know, the ant asks is he wearing the 10 rings when he hears her or something like that. And Sean she specifically says he's worn the 10 rings ever since she died. Because you know, it's like it's like Tony's armor. It it makes him feel safe and the the thing about how you know she died because he wasn't you know the the it was revenge they wanted revenge on him but they knew they couldn't hurt him because he still had the ten rings but they could hurt her and you know now he so, so yeah you know he's he's like this is never going to happen again so i'm gonna you know my son is going to be an assassin no one will ever be able to kill him the way they killed her and my daughter i don't have a daughter because if i have a daughter then i had a wife and if i had a wife then i don't have her anymore you know this whole thing i thought it worked really well i wish the movie had spent a little bit more like yeah just just you know a, a tiny bit more time on and i think i i think it could have hit harder but it did i i didn't feel like i had to like yeah i th i thought it, it it was really clever and and you know it was it was set up i wish there was a little bit more follow through on it the yeah nah. but yeah i i was surprised that it i mean it is really is the entire last third of the movie that is in Ta Lo. 
Now, once I realized that you know both Katie and Trevor were going to be comic relief, I was I wasn't sure how they were going to keep it from becoming too much, and they managed. Like Katie was kind of toned down once Trevor. Yeah, you know, Trevor kind of took over as comic relief for a little bit there. And we see Shang-Chi learn from his aunt how to fight like his mom so he can defeat Wen Wu. And yeah, we get the, the flashback of, you know, she died because of a gang that Wen Wu had hurt. And it's it's that thing of, you know, like when when Wu was going around, you know, it's attacking all these groups and and just being being this ruthless you know yeah. He was like he figured they can't get me. Because I'm strong. I'm stronger than they are. I have a weapon that they will never be able to defeat. So I can just, you know, I can treat them as brutally as I want. And then one day he falls in love. And, you know, it's just a matter of, like, you cannot always be there to protect your loved ones. It's just not possible. And, yeah, it, it meant that they took it out on her. Because they knew that she wouldn't be able to defeat all of them. Which, you know, I mean, you saw her. there weren't that many of them. If they had showed up when when Wu wasn't, like, he would have just grabbed the Ten Rings. Because he still had them. He put them away. But he had them. He had physical access to them. Whereas she, like, her powers... Let's see, if I understand correctly, basically, she would have had to stay close to Tao Lao in order to keep the powers and because she left there and was gone for so long she no longer had access to the powers and yeah it's it's a gripping story and it's you know we've heard a story like that before someone who was really vicious and hurt a lot of people but then they fell in love and so some of the people that they hurt killed the person they loved to get back at them you know, it's it's a very, you know, yeah, it's 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 popular because it's a very easy way to quickly get across to people. There are consequences, you know, even if you think right now nothing can hurt you, so you can just hurt others no matter what, you know, you'll never have to pay. One day there will be, you know, and taking a story like that and then making the the characters like ah what's the word you know making yeah making someone who experienced that the villain in this massive movie you know yeah like everyone can understand every everyone cares enough about at least one other you know Maybe for some people it'll be a pet, not a living, not a person, but, you know, everybody has someone that they care that deeply about. And, and yeah, the movie does such a great job making us understand where Wen Wu was coming from. And... Yeah, I kind of already mentioned, you know, Wen Wu... He thinks that the rings, he, he always has the rings on. He thinks they make him strong, but in some ways they actually make him weak. You know, he would be strong. He, he's essentially, um, he needs them. He, it's like a drug to him now. It's how he feels safe. Now... I quite liked, you know, we we see a flashback where Wen Wu gets revenge on some of the people 
responsible for his wife's death. And part of the fight is shown in a reflection. And then the guy gets thrown into the glass so it breaks. And just, yeah, really nicely done. You know, the... the Is it just a thing now? Because the last three movies, three, the last three movies, one of them wasn't even a comic book adaptation. But this Candyman 2021 and The Suicide Squad all had a scene of violence where some, at least some of it is shown in a reflection, in, in like a mirror or, or something. Is, I, I don't know if it's just a thing. or it, I guess it could be completely random. But, yeah. I mean, the, the, the pandemic has made everybody spend more time at home. It's hard to avoid mirrors when you're at home all the time. Even if you're not preparing for how you're going to look when you go out. So... But then weren't these movies shot before, at least a lot of them shot before the pandemic? So, yeah, I don't know. And, yeah, we've, you know, we've told that Shang-Chi at 14 did kill the, the person who killed his mother. And then he felt that he had, you know, he, he wanted to, a fresh start. And, yeah, I can't help but note that both Wenwu and Strange Supreme believe that they, you know, they believe that they are able to save a loved one. That, the, you know, they maybe understand, okay, what I'm doing is a little unorthodox. I'm not supposed to do it, whatever. I'm only going to do it once. There's only one person I have to save, but I have to save that one person. And, yeah, you know, there, there's a lot in, you know, recently in the, in the MCU, there is a lot of, like, I don't know, I guess I'm going to call it Echo. You know, both, yeah, you know, Strange Supreme and whatever Doctor Strange it is in the Spider-Man Far From Home trailer, both, you know, use some magic that, that they shouldn't, even though Wong specifically tells them this is a bad idea. You know what? You're a smart guy. I'm going to leave because I know you're smart enough that I don't have to watch you every second to make sure you don't do something stupid. And then, you know, in this end with Strange Supreme, you have them... Yeah, because, like, obviously they know, you know, like when... You, you hear when Wu say... I, I hear my wife's voice. He knows what that sounds like, you know. He, he gets that it, you know, yeah. And really great fight in Talo between Win Wu's people and the Talo people. And... Yeah, and when Wu opens the gate with the rings, and we see that when Wu's forces cannot stop the Soul Eaters, only the Talo people and their weapons can. Razor fits. Razor fist. We we see him try to cut through a Soul Eater, and it just heals. So he gets one of the swords from the the Talo people. Then he picks up another sword from them. So he's dual wielding swords. Now, I grant it is possible that, like, I blinked and missed it. But if I... If not, then I feel I can comfortably assert that the movie showed a character about to dual wield machetes in order to cut through mythical beings. And then the movie did not show that character dual wielding, cutting through mythical beings. And I'm just. I, 
I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. I I thought I'm I'm acting. I'm just presenting. I'm okay. Sometimes people don't get that. I'm just kidding. But I do think it would have been cool. I think it would have been cool to see. That's all I'm saying. Anyway. And, uh, yeah. The other people have already said the... Okay, so it's apparently not... Fin Fang Foom, I'm, I'm pretty sure, is the, the comic. It's, you know, that's, that's the dragon in the comics. But, you know, it does look a lot like him. And, yeah, I mean, it's... It's hard not to think of the never-ending story. Which, actually, I think did get that same idea from, you know, that th it got the idea from the same source, you know, so, yeah, but, let's see, the, let's see, what's the, right, yeah, and we have Shonshi fighting, like, his mother, I like the, you know, Morris runs up and and Trevor's there and I was I was sitting there like you are not going to kill off Trevor Slattery that's that's not a thing that's going to happen you are that's not happening you're not it's just not and then you know it goes over and like you know it 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 does that thing where like you know lifting the the paw to try to see you know and it seems to accept, oh, he's dead. And it's, it's like whimpering a little bit. And then he's like, I'm just, I'm just acting. But we, you know, go on quick, play, you know, pr pretend you're dead so that they won't, you know. And, and then he kind of lays back down. And it does, it does a perfect, like, <laughs> it already had a lot of, like, puppy dog-like traits. But it does a perfect, like, play dead. Like, if you, you know, if, if you teach a dog tricks and you teach it to play dead, you know, it, the way it'll, it'll lay, like, that was really funny. That was, <laughs> and, and even Trevor's like, okay, and they call me a ham. Yeah, I... Yeah, so the, this note, this is just where I noted it chronologically, but it was actually something that I kept noticing in fights. And, like, yeah, I kept getting... I, I didn't note it earlier, but I, I noted it at this point. A lot of the fight scenes, you see moves and counter moves. Like, it's not... They're not just, like, waving their arms... They actually do things that, you know, the, it, one, one example is that, like, when Shonshi was fighting Death Dealer, and, like, let's see, I think at first Death Dealer had, like, two knives, and Shonshi manages to disarm one of them, and now they both have one each. And then there's, like, a point where, let's see, I... Yeah, and, and sh you know, Death Dealer has at least one knife. And Sean, she, instead of, like, trying to, like, grab the, the wrist and such, which he did earlier, he, like, kicks the hand. And it's like, yeah, if you, if you kick, like, it is extremely difficult to hold on to something. If someone, you know, to, for it to not go flying out of their hand. If someone kicks that hand, you know, and, and there were a lot of things like that, you know, the, the, yeah, really incredible martial arts. And, you know, when Wu says, I have to save her, she's calling to me. And we see the, the dweller exit. It's really, really cool looking. Now, let's see. And, let's see. The, yeah, the Dweller kills Wen Wu and fights the dragon. And Shang-Chi uses the rings. And he's, like, really, really good at it. 
and really good final fight versus the dweller and you know Katie has been like okay as long as you know just give me just give me a little bit of direction just give me you know but then the the guy who's there to, to train her is is taken out so she's all on her own and Yeah, and then, you know, Katie fires the arrow. Yeah, and the... I, I thought it was, it was very funny when the, like... You know, Katie and Sean, she explain all the adventures. And then, like... The lawyer friend is like, okay, very funny, I get it, ha ha, I know what you're saying isn't true, okay, I, okay, fine, I was direct last time, what I said was true, and I really don't appreciate you making fun of me for saying you should be more serious, okay, so, a week ago, you were just, you know, um, valets, and now you're saving the world. Okay, so where is the, you know, where is your martial arts champion, you know, fighting tournament running sister that's so amazing? Oh, you know, she's shutting down the, the you know, the, the massive criminal empire. Oh, really? Hmm, yeah, I'm sure. That was, that was very funny. And then, like, you know, as she's sitting there saying that, like, we see the, the portal being formed behind, and she's, what, what is the, and, and she looks back, and I'm like, holy crap, you know, <laughs> and, and Wong, it, it shouldn't make me laugh as hard as it did, but, you know, he's like, Shang-Chi, present? <laughs> How is it that funny? It's such a it's such a silly joke. It's such a it's such an obvious joke. But it works. It just really, really works. And and they just and they walk through the portal and they, bye, we'll we'll Venmo you for the for the cause because that's important right now. Just you know. I gotta go save the world, but I swear I will pay for, for the drinks, you know, just and and it is a good like you know i mean now that wong no you know wong excuse me so wong knows about shang chi but wong is in the trailer for spider-man no way home but he's leaving, so maybe he's leaving to go spend time with Shang-Chi, or maybe... I mean, it's possible that movie is just set in, you know, a, a different time. Yeah, anyway. And and we get the mid credit scene with Wong, Captain Marvel, and uh, Bruce Banner trying to figure out, you know, and all of them are like, I don't... I did I I researched I have no idea what these what these rings I don't know you got me and and I you know and Captain Marvel's like oh you know oh wait uh there's a there's a thing uh yeah Bruce can can give you my number I got to go bye and she disappears and then Bruce is like I I can't give you her number I don't I don't have her number she does that all the time and you know because like at this point you know the, the the creative minds behind the MCU are aware they have to kind of acknowledge you know there are kind of a lot of situations where it seems like Carol Danvers could have been really really useful and she's just always out you know just yeah 
I personally, I think, I hope that they, in, in the, the second, you know, okay, so it's now called The Marvels, if I recall, uh, you know, the second movie where, yeah, where Carol Danvers is, is, I mean, I'm assuming she's still the protagonist, you know, but yeah, the, the second movie that she's in that isn't an Avengers movie, I guess. I think they should just do, like, a brief, you know, sim similar to how, like, in Endgame, we see that the, the Ancient One was fighting in the Battle of New York. She just kept that, you know, she wasn't making a big deal out of it, so that the event, because she didn't want the Avengers to know that she was doing it. And I think they just, just do something like that with the events of Avengers 1 and 2, show that, you know, Carol Danvers, she showed up. But she, like, you know, yeah, she 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 helped as much as she could without revealing herself. And maybe, you know, yeah, I, I don't think you need much to, to show. And anyway, but yeah, like, I guess Wong is just the new Nick Fury now. Like, because, uh, okay, so technically this is the first time he's doing it. But I'm just saying, you know, he shows up. And is like, you gotta, you know, we, we have to, yeah, you know, you're, you're part of the overall thing now. And then we have the, let's see. right, uh, a couple of things before I get to the post credit scene. I thought it was too bad that the climax, like, the, the... The climax, like the, the Dweller, the Dweller in the Darkness was only set up at the start of the final third. You know, it wasn't something that we'd been, that we'd known about for very long in the movie. And it's not really theme relevant. You know, it's it's not like, oh, you know, if, like, it, it doesn't, like, feed on, you know, regret for example like it it's not a it's not a monster that that grows stronger the more people the, you know the more violent people try to reform and then end up hurt you know so so that was that was a little frustrating I, you know i already mentioned you can't they they can't all be you know captain america winter soldier and black panther both of them like the final battle, you, you know, yeah, you have the, you know, these these drone things in in Captain America: The Winter Soldier, but at the end of the day, you know, the the conflict, yeah, you know, if Steve doesn't do enough to defeat Bucky, then he won't be able to prevent all the the drones from killing millions of people, and in Black Panther, you know. The, the two of them aren't just fighting, yeah, you know, the, the thing that's going, the, the big event that's going to kill a lot of people is, you know, getting these Wakandan weapons into the hands of, you know, yeah, people who, who basically just want to wage war to, let's see, if I recall, I, yeah, didn't he basically want for, for, all you know like yeah black people to to violently overthrow white you know i'm not saying you know ah let's see how do i avoid i'm not saying that there there is definitely a lot of justifiable rage from you know, like, I, I don't blame any black person for hating any white person, but obviously, you know, as, as that movie points out, that's, this is not the way, you know, yeah, the, the, the movie ends with T'Challa saying, you know, we gotta, you know, we, we, we help the rest of, yeah, we help the rest of the world, we help the, the black people in the rest of the world, but not by giving them guns, you know, but through education and such. 
Now, let's see. Yeah, and I also... I already mentioned, you know, the, the final third is so different from the first two. Like, when when they... When the, when the last third of the movie takes place in Talao, you know, just... Like, it's only at the very, very end that we briefly see the real world again, or the normal world again. And it just... I think if the entire movie had been set in Talao, or the, the like, uh, let's see. Yeah, some, something like that. All of it or none of it, I guess, is what I'm saying. I, cause, cause early on it feels like, oh, this is a movie about, you know, how this, you know, old, uh, what's it called? Crime family and their activities are going to affect the, the, you know, present day real world kind of, and and then the last part takes place in this, you know, mythical realm. So yeah, and we have the post credit scene, and we see that, you know, Shonchi's sister, she's the she's the new leader of the Ten Rings. She she didn't disband them at all, and that's yeah, and and we see like she she, you know, there's now like these big like, uh, what are they called? Like, ah. What are they called again? They're called something. Graffiti. There's like all this graffiti art and, you know, they're, they're training and they're ready to, f I just, yeah, I cannot wait for the Ten Rings to reappear. You know, honestly, I don't, I don't know what's going to appear first in an upcoming MCU movie, the Ten Rings or the Ten Rings, but see, you can't tell which of the, I, I really hope that the, the next time either the Ten Rings are worn or the organization the Ten Rings appears, that one of them gets a name that like, maybe in Eternals, maybe they'll say like, oh, you know, it's made from you know Uru Rock or something and so they start calling them the Uru Rock Rings or something but anyway that was all of those notes I'm not entirely sure if I have anything left let's see yeah I don't think I actually do have anything yeah that was it so There we go. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one or one, two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video you're gonna watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and or sharing spoiler thoughts on the movie, and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show. Currently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my next video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.